Um, so I'll just hand over to Rob. Hi, um, my name's Rob McCardle. Um, I'm a committee member of the local campaign for Real Ale. Um, I happen to also, I hate the word, but for my sins, <laughs> I'm the editor of the local Leicester Drinker magazine. I've got some copies of the back which we can look at later uh, if you wish. And there's also an ale trail for anybody who wants to seek out some pubs this evening, find the best pubs in Leicester. Um, basically, I've been asked to look at beer as a social phenomenon. Not a, not a, a small subject in any way, shape or form. So 20 minutes should be easily filled. Um, as I thought about it, I thought, archaeology, um, what are you looking for? You're looking at buildings, you're looking at landscape, you're looking at e e the economy. And the more I thought about it, I realised that the relationship with beer has not been a constant at all in any way, shape or form. It's a really big subject, this. But it does reflect changes in society, it's a bit of a mirror, and there are these economic effects. Um, and I came upon this really nice quote from a gentleman, a US poet called John Cardi. Fermentation and civilization are inseparable. <laughs> Which I thought hit the nail on the head. Um, how many of you came on the train today or yesterday? Stopped at Leicester Station on the way, outside Leicester Station, you'll see a statue of Thomas Cook. Um, brought up a strict Baptist, not too far away from here. Um, and he was a, a, a zealot in the uh, local temperance society. Um, and as a result of that, he organised meetings and held anti-liquor uh, processions. And his idea for excursions came from, um, from wanting to get people to these temperance meetings. Um, and his initial Cook's tour was from, Loughborough, from Leicester to Loughborough. Now, temperance as we understand it today is complete abstinence. But in fact, in Cook's time, it didn't mean that at all. Um, drinking water was still notice, notoriously unsafe, so liquor was an absolute no-no, uh, so beer drinking wasn't totally frowned on. Um, this did have some in interesting consequences, um, and there are some suggestions that more than one of Cook's temperance tours um, became cheap days out for people wishing to drink in other towns, um, with the occasional inevitable resources. <laughs> So, Belgium, uh, Germany and Czech Republic may now be the beer tourism capitals of the world, but Loughborough seems to have been the foreign <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not going to talk about beer tourism because I know somebody's going to be talking about that later in, in, um, in the session. Um, but I'll just throw in a few statistics which just goes to show how big a thing it's become. Apart from the specialist books and the thousands of them, um, I had a quick look on the web and beer tourism, 85 million hits if you type those two words in. And for beer trips, another 56 million, which just goes to show how big business it is. The special sections in mainstream guides, such as Lonely Planet and um, the Rough Guides and so on. Um, but I found this interesting um, article, and this is... Um, about Grand Rapids in Michigan. Now, it's not the biggest city in, in, in America, but its craft, um, the visit for its craft um, beers is a two, sorry, a $12.23 million economic impact on the city every year. That's beer tourism in a middling American city. Um, 42,000 beer tourists visit the city annually and they spend $7 million just on the beer. Um, their total spend, uh, or the fact they've spent 14,000 nights on average in, um, in, in pursuit of beer, um, and that the overall effect was that they created something like 170 jobs just in the city directly attributable to beer tourism. Um, now, some of this is to do with, um, <coughs> apart from that, um, it's, it's made um, a lot of American cities think about beer as a tourist industry um, and um, the number of US breweries is at 125 year high 350 new ones actually opened in 2012 alone um, with all this money <laughs> in their sites a lot of cities are now actually going out to, to actively create their own beer industries not because they want beer industries but because they want the tourism that will come with it um, and um, as I say, that is the way to go. Um, I'm aware I'm not... Um, the one thing I am aware of, though, is uh, you no longer have to sign a temperance pledge to go on a Thomas Cook holiday. 
Okay, so so why are the reasons? Uh, what are the reasons um, for um, some of these social phenomena? Well, first of all, there's uh, the healthier consumer option. The um, the growth of new breweries has gone hand in hand with things like the slow food movement in Italy. Italian breweries had almost disappeared after the Second World War, um, and the ones that did exist were, were just turning out the regulation fizzy rubbish really um, the brewing industry in northern Italy has now grown tremendously and that's on the back of the slow food movement which is on the back of this healthier lifestyle thing um, and um, lifestyle changes in themselves have, have changed the brewing landscape home brewers have got uh, have, uh, partly been um, prevented from going to bars and so on because of drink drive rules in various parts of the world They've actually turned their attention to home brewing. Some have found they're quite good at it, and they think, "Hey, I've got a business here." So they've actually, as a result of of a change in the drinking environment due to drink drive rules, they've created created an industry where more and more people focus on places they can walk to. So this is a big thing in in America. Um, and there's the economic factors. Um, the changes in the environment is particularly uh, noticeable in certain parts of the world. Um, northwestern uh, states of America, Idaho, Oregon and Washington um, are actually putting masses and masses of uh, acreage down to hops now which was never the case in the past so much so that uh, the growth has been 38% in three year period 2012 to 2015. Um, Europe it's, it's been less uh, problematic, uh, less um, growth because people have moved away from beers but what we have found is that it's partly because the hop varieties have improved and they, um, there was less requirement now for the bitterness because they, they create, and you'll know this, they'll create more alpha acids now than they used to. So you need less breakage to create the same amount of alpha acids, which basically means you need to less, grow less hops. But American breweries are, have been buying up hops by the mountainful, which is why your beer prices are going up recently because there is a worldwide hop shortage all of a sudden which hasn't been there for years. Um, I'm just going to do a little bit on the history of hops, I mean, I'm just conscious that uh, probably I've got a little bit too much on this, but it, was, it probably, it, the na native British brew was, it was actually ale which was originally made without hops. So when somebody says they're going out for a real ale, they're not. There's a, the number of real ales that are actually in existence are probably 0.5 five percent of all the ales you'll see um, the only true real ales that are probably brewed at the moment are things that you'll see with gluten free on which are generally made from oats um, but um, yeah anything with hops in is technically a beer not an ale um, so uh, yeah if somebody tries to tell you otherwise you've got a really good answer um, your acronym. Uh, exactly <laughs> exactly well yeah it is a big argument it is it is it's it's, uh, it's always a good uh, it's a good jesting point there yeah um yeah so um hops were only introduced in the 14th 15th centuries um and um that was that that was as um, just a consequence of uh, changing culture um, the word beer and ale mean much the same today, but the word ale was originally reserved for those brews without hops, just for malts, um, the original drink of the Anglo-Saxons and English. Beer became probably from Italy, uh, from Germany rather, and cultivated in the Low Countries from the 13th century. Um, the reason it happened was the brewers started to import dried Flemish hops, um, and they'd used to, to create a new flavour really, to give bittering. It wasn't something that was common at the time, but they, they found a market for it. Um, it also um, was a cheaper way of making drink. So um, as with brewers anywhere, they're always looking for a cheaper way of making the same thing if they possibly can. So uh, that, was, that was how it happened. Um, in time, this, um, this, the unhop beer became unpopular in itself because obviously people saw sort of, actually, we quite like it now. It's been drinking it for 200 years. Customers began to drink, uh, um, mix the drinks between different flavours, and that led to what we now know as porter, um, which uh, the most famous um, exponent was Arthur Guinness. Um, porter. Um, was this mixture and it was favoured by the Billingsgate market porters that's where um, 
That's where he, he spotted it, saw it was popular, and took it back to Dublin and, and started making it in Ireland. Um, the, the other thing was that um, Porter lent itself a lot to mass production, which meant you could employ staff, you could you could, didn't just have to work out of um, out of your house. So it became the first potential factory beer. So it created an industry in that sense. So you had um, you had people who were for the first time being employed to brew beer rather than just to be a cottage industry. Um, and hops were brewed in every region of the UK um, in, at one point, but eventually beer styles again changed um, and um, so things moved on. Um, one thing that was quite interesting about hops when it was um, grown in, in big quantities, particularly in the, in the Kent um, area, where it's, where it's still a stronghold, um, was that um, it did offer holiday employment for a, a lot of people from the East End who couldn't afford to leave London and they actually went on working holidays to Kent to pick hops. So it had an economic effect but also had a social effect of getting them out of the smoggy London. And I think there's some evidence on this, although I'm finding it very, find it very hard to actually pin it down, that people who actually did spend their summers in Kent um, tended to have a, a slightly long life expectancy just for those two or three weeks that they spent each summer out in the fresh air. Um, but I think the thing that probably focuses most of our minds when we think of beer is pubs and um, the, the, the evolution of the pub in itself is quite interesting. Um, it actually started I suppose as an Italian cafe which came with the Romans. Um, and it was the invading Romans that, that brought the tavern, or tabernae as it was called in those days, to, uh, to Britain in, in um, 43 AD. Um, ale was already the native brew, and the tabernae quickly realised that they were just not going to make money just by selling wine to the Roman soldiers. So uh, they started to serve the locals. Um, taverns and alehouses not only survived, but continued to adapt every time we were invaded by the Vikings, the Angles, Saxons, so on and so forth. Um, but it got to a point where in, uh, 19, sorry, in 970 AD, um, King Edgar attempted to limit the number of alehouses because they were just becoming too popular. You were only allowed one alehouse per village. Um, and uh, he's said to have been introduced, uh, responsible for introducing the, the drink measure known as the peg. Um, now the peg means you've got constant measures, it was the first constant measure and the peg actually went up the inside of a glass um, or, or a wooden tankard as it was in those days. Um, if you found somebody was drinking too much, you said you'd taken down a peg or two just to make sure they were still on the right side of sober, hence the saying. Um, there are so many sayings to do with beer that um, you, um, in common usage, um, and um, so I've got one or two of them I can tell you later. Um, but yes, so taking a peg down, the peg, taking down a peg or two uh, was, uh, was, was a saying from there. Anyway, the, the provision of food and drink for guests was the thing with a tavern or an alehouse. Um, inns were for, purely for travellers, and inns grew up because monasteries, which were the traditional people who looked after pilgrims, uh, got to the stage where they couldn't accommodate enough. So uh, inns were like an adjunct to uh, to the to the uh, monasteries. Uh, inns social other social purposes said military purposes. Frequently they were used for recruiting offices. Um, the, anybody who's aware of the old trip to Jerusalem in Nottingham uh, dates from eleven eighty nine. That was used or said to have been used for recruiting troops for the Crusades as far back and uh, various other wars. Um, the term public house first came into being round about the period of Henry the Seventh, um, and um, innkeepers at that point had to start having a license in order to run a pub. Um, you um, got to a stage where the individual pubs um, again became incredibly popular. There was a survey of 1577 where. Um, the number of drinking establishments for England and Wales was 14,202 alehouses, a further 2,000 inns and taverns, which means for every purse, for every place you could drink, you only needed 187 people because that was the ratio, 187 people to every pub 
Um, I think only the city of York comes anywhere close to that with about 300 these days. Um, coffee and tea obviously were introduced into Britain in the uh, mid 1600s. They pushed beer down in popularity amongst the uh, um, more money classes. Um, but um, just a few decades later, um, you had the situation where um, the, um, the, the the general populace started to get into spirits in a big way uh, with gin, and this was on the back of the popularity, of course, of um, of, of um, William um, William of Orange, and um, he basically or his followers brought the, those things into into, uh, into the UK. Um, Inns changed yet again with the coming of the stagecoach. Um, and uh, these basically picked up on strategic routes up and down across the country. Um, food, drink and accommodation, as you would expect, changing horses and so on and so forth. Um, but it also, and then I found this quite interesting, also, also for the first time introduced social class into pubs. Um, because the age of the stage coach meant that you had people who travelled inside the coach, you had people on the, uh, on the outside of the coach and the drivers and so on, and they all had separate rooms in, in a pub. So the distinction um, of the saloon, which was for the for the rich people who could travel afford to travel inside the stagecoach, um, became the, like the first class accommodation, and then the public bar would be for the people who were the outsiders, and then um, the actual coachman they would probably just stand at a table at the back of, of the of the pub in, a, in a, another room again. Um, these distinctions continued with rail travel. Uh, from the 1840s onwards, um, and of course with the rail, um, with the first, second and third class service, pubs again developed along these ways. Brunel in fact um, was the first to design a circular bar because it was the quickest way to serve a lot of people um, between <laughs> changes for trains. So the circular bar is all down to, um, or the island bar as we know it now, is all down to uh, Brunel basically trying to get people to change trains as quick as possible. Um, yeah. Another big change um, was in, oh, sorry, um, in uh, 1830, and this was the Beer Act. Um, what had happened with um, this, the, basically the situation with gin and the gin craze, was it caused so much alcoholism and general mayhem. Um, the taxes changed on gin, and gin again became what well, gin became too expensive. The poor started drinking beer again, and there was actually favourable taxes to encourage people to drink more beer. The Beer Act of 1830 um, and, uh, basically encouraged this situation, and the um, unruly dens that you might have seen or in um, or heard, read about in Charles Dickens' sketches by Boz, which are particularly graphic. Um, that situation um, basically brought it all to a head. Uh, the beer houses um, were very simple. Um, under the 1830 Act, any householder who paid rates could apply with a one-off payment of two guineas um, to sell beer outside of its home and even brew on his own premises. Um, this was usually served in jugs and directly from the tap wood barrels on the table in the corner of the room. And that's where you get the name tap room. That's where it originates. It's the first time it was used in common parlance. The profits were so high on these beer houses, the um, owners were often able to buy the house next door to live in as well, turning every room in their former house into the bars. And then you started to get the multi, multi room pub. Um, in the first year, 1830, 400 beer houses opened and with eight, eight years there were 46,000 across the country and they far outnumbered traditional inns and pubs and uh, hotels by, at that stage. Because it was so easy to get permission, the profits could be huge, um, the number of beer houses actually again got out of hand manage it, and then um, they, they were only checked in 1869 uh, by magisterial control, new licensing laws yet again. Um, these new licensing laws meant there was no more new beer houses but some of them then said okay we'll go the full hog and we'll, we'll, we'll become proper pubs and so they got the extra license and became proper pubs not you know, serving um, spirits and wines as well um, you can actually identify a lot of the old beer houses um, they're usually quite small 
and they're usually in the centre of a terrace. So um, if you ever see pubs in the centre of a terrace, that was almost certainly be started life as a beer house. Pubs, dedicated pubs, were nearly always built on the corner of a block, um, um, and that's or a, a major road junction. So if you ever see one in the middle of a terrace, you know that was almost certainly a beer house in the early days. Um, many of today's big brewers started with a single beer house. Um, and um, beer houses tended to have whimsical names, so they, they avoided the stereotype Red Lion Crown and all those sorts of things. Um, next big shift, I suppose, was quite recent with the Smoking Man, which again changed people's habits. And this, uh, throughout the theme throughout all this is really about people's habits changing and um, when they change and why they change. And it's a, it's a completely moving target. People's tastes for beer have gone up and down according to the price of other things. As you can see with gin, when gin became readily available and, and um, cheap to drink, people went with that. So um, there's no room for complacency. <laughs> We're in a situation now where um, real ales are, are, are improving and um, growing in quantity all the time. But it could soon change again. It, it just takes takes a small change in licensing laws or in regulatory environment. Um, probably the last three UK governments have done an immense amount to help um, in, in promoting new breweries. What they probably haven't done enough to do is to help with um, new pubs um, and to help pubs escape from the dreaded brewer's tie. Some of the documentation I've got on the back there, or you'd be able to have a look and you'd be able to read some of that sort of stuff. Um, are we doing for time? Just add that on. Okay, I've got, I, I, I was going to go into some more detail about the, the, the ins and outs of pubs, but um, I've got plenty. <laughs> I've, got plenty. <laughs> I've got so much to tell you. So I'll probably, um, I'll probably think about one now. Now, um, some of the social aspects of um, beer, breweries and beer and brewing generally um, is the, the spin-offs and there's a whole industry now of spin-offs of, of things related to brewing and people are actually making a living out of selling brewery on uh, things like beer clips and magazines and bar towels and glasses people are actually making a whole entire living out of other people's mementos and, and so on and so forth um, I'll give you a few more of these little quotes. Um, um, it's my shout, that's what you had to do in an old tavern. You sat at the table, so when you say now it's time to go to the bar, it's my shout, that's what you did. You literally, you were the one that shouted, you were the one that got the bill. So you said four drinks for my friends, that was it. Uh, small beer, that's what they used to give to children. Small beer was, um, because obviously the water wasn't pure, small beer was a low alcohol strength and when I say low alcohol it's 2.5% still that's what they used to give to children in, in, instead of water good old days. Uh, yeah in the good old days um, mind your P's and Q's that's an abbreviation mind your pints and quarts don't have too many of them um, one over the eight you obviously know what that means but the reason was um, at traditional strengths which was about 5% um, they reckon that a man should be able to hold a gallon of beer but above a, above a gallon of beer, he, he, he was permitted to uh, maybe go a little bit wayward. So, so there was one over the eight. Um, and so it goes on and on. There are so many more references. I've just got to finish with you a few. Um, quite funny, really. Um, it's just how, how language... Um, well, so that's how language sort of is, is, um, has changed through brewery and beer. Um, but also different, how different countries and different environments um, interact and even within the same country sometimes with um, with drink generally um, for instance um, and these are tips for travelers including Thomas Cook um, in Alaska it's illegal to feed alcohol to a moose <laughs> in Massachusetts there were no happy hours um, for a quite sensible reason is that it's one of the biggest ways in which the state raises taxes and a single happy hour can cost 1.3 million dollars in lost tax. Um, in Oklahoma you have to save your beer over 4%, um, it, sorry, beer over 4% at room temperature because they want to make sure you know how much alcohol is in it so they want you to know it's strong. Um, 
And in Nebraska, you can't fraternise with the bar staff. And most radical of all, in El Salvador, drink drivers face a firing squad, potentially for the first offence. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> and there was, so, and there was no. so much, and there was so much more. But um, anyway, yeah, there you go. Uh. <laughs>